the back and, and I discarded him. I didn't throw him in the yard. But Eric's like, oh, a snake? If he can say that. <laughs> but you see, no deadly thing shall harm you, God said. So why are you playing with that snake? He has given you power. He has given you power. Walk in that power. Run in that power for God. Don't let nothing stop you. You are more than a conqueror. Amen. Amen. We've been talking about victory. You want to claim victory? Step on his head. Because he keeps attacking you with your emotions, your body. Stop it. Tell him to stop it right now. Get on his head. Get, remove him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. God has called us to walk in a life that is holy and pure and upright. And we want to we want to we want to play with these serpents. We want to visit these things and they they become so familiar that they are pets. And the Lord said you need to lay some of these things down. You cry out to me for healing and wonder why you're not healed. You cry out to me because you're hurt and you wonder why you're not healed. You cry out to me for your family and wonder why your family isn't saved. You cry out to me for things and wondering why prayers are not answered. Because we can't dangle one foot in the world and expect God to move wholeheartedly in our lives. I'm not saying we don't sin. I'm not saying we don't fall. I'm not saying we don't make mistakes. I'm saying when we deliberately try to balance, I'll show them I'm a Christian with, but the rest of the week I'm going to live like this. No, you're powerless. Why am I not hearing from God? What is your life like during the week? It's not a rebuke. That's an observation when the That's Lord right. is saying to you this That's morning, right. this is an opportunity while the Spirit of the Lord is here to just say, Lord, I need to lay some things down this morning. I need, to, I need to discard some things. I need to give up these little sins that at first were so innocent. And at first I may have even had a little bit of conviction about them. But now I've embraced them so much that they've become pets. Come on. You see, church, when things become more important to you than God is important to you, those are idols. And God says, I'll have no other gods before me. You're wondering why God isn't moving in your life. It's because you have idols in your life. Father, help us this morning. Help us just to, yes, we're under grace. <laughs> and I understand we're under grace. But your word makes it clear we're not to trample on that grace. Amen. Grace is not a reason for us to continue in our worldliness. Grace is not a reason for us to continue to dabble in sin. And to embrace these pets. Give us the wisdom and the vision to recognize these things. And to lay them down. That we may come to you and walk in power. And authority. And the body of Christ said, Amen. 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 You know what your best praise. Come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
You know, it's amazing how what God has done over the last few weeks and months at the storehouse. Look around and say, wow, you guys are really good looking. Again, for those of you watching on Facebook or our new improved website, welcome aboard. We're so glad to have you. If you haven't checked out our website yet, go to thestorehouse.church. It is really, uh, it's amazing. It's been upgraded. It looks good. It functions well. It's idiot resistant because I can use it. So if I can use it, you can navigate it. It's pretty sweet. So check out our new website. Um, thank you for watching. If you're on Facebook and our website, we appreciate your faithfulness. Realize that there are still folks who aren't comfortable being out in a crowd, and I get that. Thank God that we have some live stream technology. Amen? Amen. If this had happened 30 years ago, we wouldn't know what we, we'd be writing letters to each other. Asking, how are you doing? You know, so we can still see each other and virtually have church together. One thing I've learned as your pastor is that the Holy Spirit is not limited by the, uh, the screen on your computer. Amen? amen? The Holy Spirit can still show up, can still accomplish mighty things, and the body of Christ said, Amen. amen. So listen, this morning I love worship. I, how many of you think the worship is just getting better and better? I think it's just, just getting better every week, man. And the Spirit of God is showing up, and uh, I love that. And everything that Pastor Leanne had teed up this morning really kind of dovetails right into our message today. So are you ready to get into the Word? Say amen. 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 Father, we thank you this morning for your Word in our lives. We thank you that um, it, it, you have given us the Word of God. So that we can be corrected and rebuked and so that we can be instructed and matured and we can grow in grace and maturity and that we can impact and instruct other people's lives as your disciples call us forth and enable us to disciple others in Jesus name and the body of Christ said amen. amen. Hey, so we're in the book of Acts. We're in our study called Activated. Uh, we have a new. Uh, we're going to tee up a new chapter today in Acts chapter 12. But before we get there, I want you to think about this. Think about the marvelous conversion. We've been in Acts a little while now, a, a week or two. <laughs> we're on week 22, for those of you who are counting. So we've been in Acts a little while. And uh, think of the miraculous conversions we've seen. We saw 3,000 people come to the Lord on the day of Pentecost. That's amazing. And what's even more amazing is the Bible says that, and God added to the church daily. So they started with 3,000 people. And God added daily. Then we saw the conversion of the Samaritans as the gospel spread out there. Then we saw the conversion, the powerful conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee. And God literally knocked him off his high horse to get his attention. God will do that to you. God will take you off your pride. And knock you down. Come on. Then we saw the, not many amens on that. that then, we, then we saw the conversion of Cornelius, the Gentile, and his immediate family and his entire household, which was all of his servants, his soldiers. We're talking about a man of influence. See, because when God really gets a hold of you, it's a powerful testimony, and your lives now start impacting other people's lives. Amen? That's how this is supposed to work. You do understand that, right? You do understand that we receive salvation to give away salvation. We receive God's goodness to give away God's goodness. We receive God's grace to give away God's grace. It's not buckets, it's bridges, remember? We're here to build bridges to other people. And to show them the compassion and the love and the grace that God has shown us. Then we saw this explosion last week in the church at Antioch. The first multiracial, multicultural church in existence. Thousands of people get saved at Antioch. Gentiles, Romans, Greeks, uh, Orientals, and Jews. It's this melting pot of culture. And it's the first mega church and the first multicultural church. And on our Thursday night Bible study, I remember saying this. I'm imagining what life is like as the leaders at Antioch. And I've got to imagine that most of their leadership meeting sounded something like this. I'm not sure we're supposed to do it that way. <laughs> they had no instruction book. There was nothing out there for them to follow. They're just literally making this up as they go along under, thank God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I'll bet you that church didn't look much like the church today. I'll bet you that church relied a whole lot more on the Spirit of God for direction and guidance than on Google and YouTube. <laughs> Amen? So we see this remarkable conversions all the way through the first 11 chapters. And it's exciting. And what I want you to realize is this. You know, this didn't happen in a month. 
We're now out about 12 to 14 years when we get to Acts chapter 12. So this is taking place, place over some time. And what we also have a hard time comprehending is just how far and wide the gospel has spread and how big the church has become in about a dozen years. We saw that map last week. It went all the way down to Africa. Don't forget, we saw the conversion of uh, the eunuch. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch, which ended up taking the gospel to Africa. So we've seen these mighty conversions. And I told you last week, also, as you're reading through Acts, keep in mind this. Keep in mind that there's this pattern. There's this pattern of mighty moves of God, followed by persecution, followed by desperate prayer, followed by mighty moves of God. We see it all through Acts. And there's this pattern. And I think sometimes God's very intentional in that pattern because it keeps us humble and it keeps us reliant on God. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Look, I know you've never done this, but sometimes in other churches, when God moves, some Christians are quick to say, did you see what God did because of me? <laughs> now, I'm sure you've never said that. <laughs> Sweet Jesus, I hope. <laughs> But sometimes we see God move, and, you know, I probably never said this out loud, but I've watched God move in my life once or twice, and then a situation came around a third time, and I'm pretty sure I thought, you know what, God, I got this one. <laughs> I've watched you. I'm pretty sure I got this. Come on. Anybody with me? Yeah. How'd that go? <laughs> yeah, not too good, right? Yeah, but God said, all right, man. Yeah, I'll He'll let you try. He will let you try. <laughs> So the pattern in Acts that I talked about is amazing. But here's what I want you to see, too. It's throughout church history. We see the pendulum swing all over the place. It's, it swings between expansion and opposition. It swings between growth and shrinkage. And it even swings between advance and decline. That's throughout the church history. You know, the church has not just been consistently at a plateau. It's been up and down and up and down. Last week we talked about persecution. You know that in many countries, in the top 50 countries where it's hardest to be a Christian, in many of those countries, the church has shrunk because of the persecution. Yes. You know, we always hear, well, church prospers through persecution. To a degree, that's true, but it's not true across the board. We need to pray for the persecuted church throughout the world. We need to pray for our government so that that persecution doesn't come here. Can you say amen? Are you still with me? All right, so this morning, we're going to go back to this really cool slide. I want you to see in chapter 12 how God empowers the powerless. And this just dovetails so great with what Pastor Leanne and the worship team brought together this morning. You know what? It's, I can't do much on my own, but I can do everything through Christ. So let's go to Acts chapter 12, verse 1. This is one of my favorite events in the New Testament, and you're going to learn why in about six verses. But I love this whole story about what's going on. So <clears throat> Acts chapter 1 says this. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, who was John's brother. Now, anybody remember the story of James and John? They were two of the apostles that got into a fight over who was going to be greatest in the kingdom of God. Remember that? Hey, Lord, when we get to heaven, which one of us is going to be sitting by you? That is so not what serving the Lord is all about. You realize that, right? They were arguing over which one of us. And I think their mother had something to do with that, the Bible says. that The mother stepped in. One version says the mother stepped in and said, hey, my two boys over here, you got a special place. That's such a mom. Isn't it? But Jesus quickly rebuked them. He said, you know what, it's not about elevation. Yes. It's about humility. Amen. Unless you're here to serve, you'll never be great. True. Come on, we're going to talk a lot about humility this morning. Mm -hmm. Come on, so this is the same James that wanted to be elevated. And as a matter of fact, Jesus rebuked him and John. And he said, look, what, and I'm going to have to paraphrase because I don't have the scripture. He says, look, what you don't understand is your fate is the same as my fate. You're going to meet death. You're going to meet death in a very untimely, uh, grotesque manner. And this is true for James. We're going to read And John ends up being exiled to the island of Patmos and writing the book of Revelation. So while he didn't die necessarily for as a martyr, he was exiled as a martyr and gave us the book of Revelation. Amen? So let's get back to this. That's a little sidebar history lesson. He had the apostle James killed with a sword. I think we read that sometimes, but we don't realize how horrific that is. Yeah. But here's what's worse. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, uh-oh, he arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. 
And I started thinking, Lord, why is that phrase there that took place during the Passover celebration? I'm not going to go into the whole historical context, but I am going to tell you this. When did Jesus get executed? Passover. During the Passover celebration. Yeah. So don't you think this is sending ripples through the church? Yeah. That, oh my God, we've seen this story. It doesn't end well. <laughs> Next slide. Then he imprisoned, talking about Peter, then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers. We're coming back to that. Uh, four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. Is that the last slide? Thanks. So, let's get in the picture here. King Herod, let's meet King Herod. Uh, King Herod Agrippa. He was the grandson of Herod the Great, and he was the nephew, the nephew of Antipas, who had known and tried Jesus. So we know at this point that King Herod is familiar with Jesus because his uncle was one of the ones who tried and executed Christ. So you've got to understand something now. Now, King Herod, who we're going to learn in just a moment, is really self-conscious and not a very strong ruler. And because of his self-consciousness and his lack of self-esteem and, and his lack of uh, leadership abilities, he ingratiates himself with the Jewish culture, which means, I'm going to use this word, I'm sorry, but he becomes kind of a suck-up. I'm going to follow their rules and I'm going I'm to go to synagogue, but he's Roman, and the Jews already hate him just because of his heritage, and now he's the king. So he says, well, I'll ingratiate myself with this culture. I'll go to service. I'll do all the things they do so I can stay on their good side. He did all that so that he could keep the peace throughout Palestine between the Jews and the Romans because it was a symbiotic relationship and they needed each other. Are you still with me? So that's King Herod. Uh, he, he's not really well thought of and the Jews definitely don't like him. So we meet King Herod. Here's what happens. So King Herod, now... In his self-consciousness and his lack of ability to rule, he realizes the explosion of the New Testament church. And now the church, because it's not just Jewish believers rising up, but it's Jewish and Gentile believers rising up. Now the church is a threat to his leadership. So what do we do when we're threatened? We fight or flight, right? So he chooses to fight in kind of a cowardly way. He, he arrests James. He gives him this mock trial, a very short trial, public trial. He brings him out, and he doesn't just kill him by the sword. He literally chops off his head in public. Mm -hmm. I have to say this. There might be more. So he doesn't just execute him. He chops his head off in public. And sadly, when he sees that this impresses the Jews, which ingratiates himself even, even more with the Jewish people, he goes out and he nabs Peter. And he throws Peter not in jail, he throws Peter in prison. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit more in a minute. So Peter's in prison. And it's safe to say, and I'll prove this out later, that Peter is about to suffer the same fate as James. Peter's going to have this very short mock trial, and he will be publicly executed. I would say that's a pretty lousy situation. You know what I want you to notice here, though? I want you to notice one thing that King Herod did very effectively. He went after the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Yeah. Can I say to you this morning, pray for your leaders. Yes. Pray for pastors. Yes. <laughs> you go, Pastor, your job is so easy. All you do is talk for too long on Sunday morning. <laughs> I looked up some statistics about pastors. Would you like to know about pastors? No Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> if nothing else, I'll tell you how to pray, brother. You ready? So I looked up some quick statistics. These, by the way, I found two pages of statistics. I'm not giving you those, and I'm not boring you with the numbers. But here's the highlights. 75% of current pastors suffer from extremely, are, are either extremely or highly stressed. 90% of current pastors feel fatigued and worn out every week. 91% have experienced burnout to some extent and had to step down for a season. 70%, listen to this, have lower self-esteem today than when they got into the ministry. If you think becoming a pastor elevates you to a platform where people love you, oh, you come talk to me. <laughs> If you're in this because you like the image, come talk to me. 
70% do not have anyone that they consider a close friend. Yeah. It's a lonely profession. I'm not saying that to say pity your pastor. May I make that very clear? I'm not in most of these statistics, thankfully. I, we have a really good church here. You guys are pretty kind to us most of the time. I did read a great statistic that I put, didn't put on here. It says 40-something uh, percent of pastors have a conflict with a church member every week. I'm just leaving that out there for you. You can look around and you can speculate who that might be. I'm saying this. Pray for pastors. Do you know that right now, in pre-COVID numbers, something like 1,500 churches a day were closing in the United States. 90-something percent of pastors that got into the ministry five years ago are no longer in the ministry. And less than 10% who get in the ministry make it beyond five years. This is a hard job. And I'm not saying that to garner any sympathy. What I am saying is, doesn't it make sense that the enemy would attack the leadership? Because if you kill the head, you kill the snake. So pray for your pastors. Pray for the head of the church. Pray for us. Pray for the leaders of ministries in this church. Pray for our divisional superintendents, our regionals, our president of our organization. Pray for those who are, who are, in, who are charged with the in-keeping of your soul. Can you say amen? amen? Those are scary statistics. So let's keep moving. So James is executed and Peter is in prison. And Peter's in prison between two. Now let me, he's in prison. There's four groups of soldiers. Four groups of four. Here's how this is working. Peter is in prison. And he's literally, now normally he would be strapped by one wrist, usually to the wall. That's normal. Well, how many of you know this is not Peter's first jailbreak rodeo? Right? It's his third time in jail, right? He's, been, he's got a frequent flopper card. He gets a bonus meal. He's been in so often. So what they did now, because they know his history, they chained both wrists, not to the wall, to two guards. Now, I don't know what you think about a Roman guard, but I'm thinking they're big, smelly, and intimidating. And Peter is chained to these guards 24-7. And if that's not enough, because they know his Houdini-like skills, they have two guards posted outside the door. They have Peter in lockdown. So he's in prison. He's posted between these guards. Think about this from the church's perspective. This has to look absolutely devastating. We just went through this through the Passover season with Jesus. We saw Peter arrested before. Well, now James has been executed without a trial, really virtually without a trial. This is a desperate situation. It's bleak, and to the church it's hopeless. Have you ever felt that way? You ever been in a situation that is so dark and so bleak that you just wonder, can God even move? I'm reading through this, and I, I like to put myself in the story, and I'm thinking, what can the powerless group of believers do against the mighty forces and army of the Roman soldiers? They were the power of the day. And then the Lord answers that in the next verse. Let's see that. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. I think the church had to remind themselves to remember what God had already done. Yes. This is Peter's third time in prison. And the second time in jail, he was released with the divine intervention of an angel. Remember? You do remember that? Like yeah. early on in Acts chapter or something? Yeah. So I think sometimes they had to go back and remind themselves, wait a minute. Yes, this on the outside looks hopeless, and it's certainly worse than any other time before. However, we have seen God move in the past in a similar situation. May I say to you this morning, when life gets desperate, sometimes what we need to do is take out our journals that we've written in or look behind us and say, wait a minute, I know before God has moved in a powerful way. Why am I letting the circumstances dictate to me whether or not this is hopeless? I have history on my side that says, I've prayed for this, we've prayed for this, the church prayed for this, and we watched God move in a powerful way. And we've got to bring back those testimonies. 
We have to remember what God has done. Hallelujah. Listen, I don't want to live in the past, but there's times I need to draw on the past. Because I'm, my strength right now might be a little bit down. And if I've learned nothing in life, I've learned that I can always look backwards and see that God has been consistently faithful throughout my life. Say amen. Amen. So while it seemed to be a crisis, what could we do? They prayed for Peter, and I love the scripture. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed for him very earnestly. That word earnestly, Luke uses deliberately, and it's from the Greek, it's called actinos, and it means unremittingly and fervently, without, without, without ceasing. It's the same verb that they used when Jesus was in passion and crying out in the Garden of Gethsemane. Desperate times should bring desperate prayers. Amen? Amen. <laughs> you know, you throw a barbecue at the church and everybody shows up. <laughs> throw a men's meeting, we have 14 guys. We had the best men's meeting yesterday ever. If you haven't been coming to our men's meetings, a little side advertisement here for the, for the guardsmen, we meet the first and third Saturday of every month. We have breakfast. Yesterday we had marvelous um, it's so marvelous, I forgot. Sausage, biscuits, and gravy. That's it, thanks. Biscuits and sausage gravy. Yes, thank you. See, I was so creamy and so milky and so good, my brain is still not functioning. I'm still sleepy, it was so good. Sausage and, bi sausage and gravy biscuits. So, look, we do that every time we meet, man. Waffles, pancake. But the point is, our men's group is amazing. If you're not part of it, you need to come out and be part of it. Because we really, we rally around. We, tell, we sit around the table, we tell the truth, don't we, Mark? Uh, so, so you throw a barbecue, the church shows up, have a men's meeting with breakfast, and men come out, because men will come out if you give them food. That's right, that's just a fact. Call a prayer meeting. You couldn't bring in enough food. Prayer meetings are hard. Having the ministry of intercession, that's a tough ministry. You're doing it in the dark and, in the, and alone and in your prayer closet. It's not flashy. It's not public. But desperate times, we should be desperate before the Lord. Well, I prayed. I didn't see God move. How much did you pray? I prayed for an hour. Remember Jesus in the garden? Praying so hard that he sweat, what? Great drops of blood. And he goes over to the disciples and he says, Whoa, what? Hey, could you? Yeah. You couldn't stay away one hour? Now, to be fair, the bar was set pretty high. Jesus prayed all night, all the time. Yeah. It's a pretty high bar. But be honest. How many of you pray for a few minutes and you're either getting dozy or you have to go back and remember what you were praying for? That's me. Yeah. The, the bulk of my prayers, I'm sorry, Lord, where was I? Yeah. <laughs> Prayer is hard. So while Peter's in prison, the church is praying earnestly for him. Are you still with me? Say amen. Amen. So the church is praying. Desperate times should bring desperate prayer. Let's keep moving. Uh, verse 6. So the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, I want you to see four things here in, in what happens during this prayer time. Okay? So the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was what? Asleep. <laughs> what? Asleep. Okay. Was he exhausted or was he just at peace? The night before I'm going on trial, knowing that I'm going to be executed because James was just executed, I'm not sure I'd be sleeping much. Think about, it took me back to when Jesus was on the boat and the storm blew down from, from between the mountains and the disciples who were experienced fishermen are absolutely freaking out, convinced they're going to die. And where's Jesus? He's asleep on the bow of the boat. Yesterday we discovered in our leadership meeting, if you want to be like Jesus, you got to do a couple things. You need to eat a lot, because a lot of his ministry had food involved, and take a nap. I'm like, this is pretty easy. I can be just like Jesus. So at peace was Jesus that he slept through the storm. They had to wake him up to say, dude, we're dying. Peter is about to be executed the next day. I'm sure he knows this. And I'm going to show that to you in the scriptures. And he's asleep. 
So here's some things that prayer does. Number one, it'll bring you peace. Amen. Philippians says, be anxious for nothing. nothing. But in all things, through prayer and supplication. See, you can't be anxious and live in faith. You can't have fear over here and faith over here. you got to pick a side. You can't say, you know what, I'm going to pray for this situation. I'm going to believe God and I'm going to stand in this. And then you step over here and say, well, you know what, I'm just not sure what to do. What's God going to do? What am I supposed to do? No, have faith or don't have faith. Prayer, whether it's your prayer or people praying for you, should bring you peace. Peter Amen. is fast asleep. I don't think we get it. He's asleep between two guards. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. How do you sleep between two guards? It's the peace of God. It's the peace of God that says to you, no matter what you're going through tonight... I'm going to grant you such sweet sleep in your confidence in me. So he's fastened between two guards. He's falling asleep. Other guards stood at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light uh, in the cell. And an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. Keep going. Okay. I'm going to stop it because I'm missing some things. So what does prayer do for you? Number one, prayer brings peace. If you don't have peace about a situation, pray for it. Yeah. Ask God, Lord, bring me peace. Help me to stand in confidence in what you're instructing me to do. The second thing Peter does, or the prayer does, um, he's fastened with two chains between soldiers. Let me catch up in my place. And the angel of the Lord struck him on the side to wake him and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Second thing prayer does is it takes the chains off your life. It takes off those things that are binding you and holding you and holding you in prison. So it gives you peace. It breaks the chains. He says, get up and get dressed. Put on your sandals. Put on your coat and follow me. That's what the angel ordered. Next scripture. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. Peter's in that twilight zone. You ever been there? You wake up, you're not sure if you're still asleep or still awake. Sometimes if you really meditate, truly meditate before the Lord, there's that zone where you're not sure, uh, is this really from God or is this me? And I think Peter, because he's a pretty experienced guy in the presence of the Lord, he's still not really sure if this is fact or fantasy. Yeah. So he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. So first thing prayer does is it brings peace. Second thing it does is it breaks your chain. Third thing prayer does is this. They pass the first and second guard points. What does it do? It nullifies your enemy. They literally walked right past the guard. So Peter's praying while he was asleep at peace. He wakes up. An angel tells him, get up. The chains fall off. He gets up. He gets dressed. The angel tells him, literally, dude, okay, first off, the angel has to whack him in the head to get him away. It says, he had, the, the angel had to like tap him on the side. Dude, wake up. And Peter's like, I don't know what's going on. What's happening? Get up. Put your sandals on. Put your coat on. He's giving them step-by-step -step instructions. You know, God's really good at that if we'll listen. Yes. Yes, he does. Yes. And he says, follow me. So prayer brings peace. Prayer breaks the chains. Prayer nullifies the enemy. They walk right past the guards, who obviously, the chains had fall off. The guards were still there. They're asleep. The guards at the gate are asleep. Fourth thing it does is this. They passed the first and second guard posts, and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. And what happened? And the gate opened up by itself. The fourth thing prayer does is it opens doors for you that no man can open. And those prisons that the enemy tries to put you in, it opens those doors so that you can be set free. Jesus said what? I have come to set the captive free to heal the oppressed, right? So that what prayer does is it opens these gates of, that are binding us so that we can walk in freedom. So they, so they passed through and started walking down the street. And then the angel suddenly left him. Next verse. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. <laughs> but he realized he was no longer in jail. The Lord has sent an angel. Listen, this is important. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. The fifth thing that prayer does is it, it loosens and it sends heavenly warriors to your defense. He says, the Lord has sent angels to deliver me from what man wanted to do to me. 
So listen, when you pray, it brings peace, it breaks chains, it opens doors, it, um, and it, it, it unleashes heavenly forces on your behalf. If we truly understood that, we would never stop praying. Amen. Come on. Amen. I'm going to show you even the disciples may not have truly understood that. Let's keep moving. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Surprisingly, as I said, Peter isn't really sure what's going on. And that prompted me to ask a question to myself. Do you think it's sometimes possible that we miss God's move that's right in front of us because we're spiritually asleep? Yes. I think it's a possibility. God's trying to show you, son, I'm doing this. And we're, not, we're, we're, we're just not get, getting it. Sometimes our prayer needs to be, Lord, open my eyes so that I see things like you see things. Give me the vision that you have so I see things like you do. I want to see that you're moving, and I never want to be spiritually asleep. Let's keep moving, because now we're at my favorite part of this event. So when Peter realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for what? Listen, when something goes on, the church needs to gather for prayer. Are you with me? Amen. We need to be, and our women's group is amazing at doing that. They send out this all points bulletin to every woman on the planet. Pray for this, pray for this, pray for this. And I'm pretty sure every woman on earth is praying for something at some point. They're really good at that. So there, there were the, all the people that gathered. He knocked, he knocked at the door at the gate. So let me explain this. The, the house is over here. There's an outer courtyard. There's a gate in the outer courtyard. So he can't get into the door of the house. So he's knocking on the gate at the outer courtyard. Are you with me? It's my favorite part of the story here. So he knocked at the door in the gate. And a servant girl named Rhoda, now it's interesting that they call her by name, she was obviously integral in the story, yes. or they just would have said the servant girl showed up. So Rhoda shows up to open the gate. And when she recognizes Peter's voice, so I can imagine, I'm coming on, it's me, Peter. She's so excited that she forgets to let him in. <laughs> She said, well, we're praying for you. Let me go tell the disciples. You're not going to believe this. Peter's at the door. <laughs> Wait a minute. He's at the door. And they say to her, next slide. They say, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> they said, you're out of your mind. <laughs> I love this part. So Peter's knocking. Open up, it's Peter. It's me. Now they know he's in prison. But here's the irony. What are they praying for? They're praying for him to get out of prison. So he shows up at the door, and it's almost like they're saying, hey, don't interrupt us. We're praying for you. <laughs> she runs in. She's so excited. Now, look, I would hope if my wife were at the gate, she would open the door and say, Honey, you're home. It's a miracle. She does that every time I come home from church. <laughs> she does not do that. <laughs> but wouldn't you think she recognized his voice? And I don't know if she was excited or had a, a senior moment. I don't know what happened. But she runs back to the disciples and says, Peter's at the gate. Now, okay. I kind of get why she might have done that. But what I don't get is the disciples' reaction. Yes. You're nuts. Yes. He can't, listen, we're praying for him. He can't be at the gate. What? <laughs> it must be his angel. So meanwhile, Peter continues knocking. Just, seriously, it's me. No, open, I have ID. <laughs> And they finally opened the door. I don't know how much time passed, but I just think this is an amazing story. And it could be, honestly, that they're so focused on prayer that they're not focused on the answer to prayer. Come on? Sometimes God's going to move while we're praying. And I'm going to give you this point at the end, but a spoiler. We need to pray expecting, not hoping. Now you say, well, Pastor, the Bible says that faith is the evidence of things hoped. Yes, it is. But there's an expectation to our prayers. Prayer isn't a wish. 
that we hope will come true. It's something we plead with God for and we expect the answer. And when the answer shows up at the door, open the door and embrace it and give God some glory. Say amen. amen. So Peter's out of prison. He continues knocking. I don't know how long he's at the door. He, he continues knocking. Um, then when they finally opened the door and they saw him, they were amazed. And he motioned for them to be quiet down. So here's what I figured out in my notes in my head. They finally realize it's Peter. They bring him inside and they break out in celebration. Now remember, they're probably in the same upper room where Pentecost took place. And they know that James had just been killed. Peter's no longer in prison. That's problematic. And they break out in celebration. And Peter's saying, no, 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 no. You can't do this. They're going to find us. And then he says to them, to quiet down, he tells them how the Lord had taken him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened. And then he went to another place. As we pray, pray expecting. Yes. As we pray, believe God for an answer. Oh, yeah. Don't be surprised if the answer shows up earlier than you thought it should show up. And don't be surprised if it shows up in a manner in which you didn't expect it to show up. Yeah. Amen? Let's embrace the answered prayer. Yeah. Say amen. Amen. Next page. So my question in this passage to myself and to you is this. Does answered prayer sometimes surprise you? And maybe it's because we're not really expecting the answer. I have prayed for things in my life and then I got up and walked away and thought, okay, I did my duty, I prayed. Come on, have you ever done that? Yeah. I think we need to pray expecting. We need to pray expecting God to move. Prayer delivered Peter from prison. So let's shift gears here. We're going to end with this passage right here. So at dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what had happened. So why is there a great commotion? Because they came to, they woke up, and guess who wasn't there? Peter, their prisoner. So they're looking at each other, wondering, is this an inside act? Was it conspiracy? Did somebody, uh, did, did they have a mole inside? How did Peter get away? So they're... Uh, there's commotion among the soldiers about what happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for him, and when he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Why is that important? Because under Roman rule, if you were in charge of, it, of someone who was imprisoned, and that prisoner escaped your charge, you suffered the fate that they were sentenced to suffer. So that tells me that Peter was sentenced to be executed. And instead the guards were executed. Let's keep moving. Afterward, Herod left Judea uh, to stay in Caesarea for a while. Now Herod was very angry. We're going to blow through this and we're going to tie it up with this. Now Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So that uh, he sent a delegation to make peace with them because their cities were dependent on each other for Herod's country for food. Uh, Herod's country was a leading uh, supplier of corn, and the countries in, around the neighbor, around that area, needed to rely on that. So the delegates that they sent won the support of Blastus. Say it with me, Blastus. It's the coolest name in the New Testament. It's like a superhero name. If I was going to be a superhero to be a hero, I would be Blastus. <laughs> Herod's personal assistant. So they won the uh, support of Blastus, his personal assistant. And they got an appointment with Herod, okay? So they go in to see Herod. Let me make this really quick. They go in to see Herod. There's this entire delegation of people. Now remember, he's still a bit of an ingratiator, a suck-up. And they send this delegation, and he walks out, he grants this meeting. And he doesn't just walk out to have a meeting with them. He puts on his best royal robes. And he's got all this pomp and circumstance. And he walks out there with all of this kingship on him and he sits on his throne they've only asked for a meeting and he starts to speak and those around in the crowd go he speaks as though he is a god <laughs> not a man wow. you know what he's concerned about most his image yep. It's important to him that he looks like a king, that he walks like a king, and that he orates like a king. May I say to you today, there are people in the church that they're concerned about their image. Yes. 
Jesus never said anything about our image. He said that if we're going to serve, we need to be the least of these. That if, he said he didn't come to serve. Or he didn't come to be served. He came to serve. Yes. And that we don't truly understand leadership till we can get down to a level where we serve people. And listen, if you want to be a pastor, you better not be worried about an image. Because yeah. your image is whatever people tell other people. So he's concerned about his image. So let's fast forward here. Instantly, an angel strikes him dead with a sickness because he had accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with worms and died. How would you like that to be your legacy? Remember Pastor Eric? He was so cool till those worms ate him to death. Josephus, the historian, says this, that Herod was riddled with a common disease at the time. Tapeworms and internal intestinal worms were common. He was riddled with a disease so bad that the pain literally rose up within him. He doubled over in agony. He was carried to his palace. He never came to and he died five days later. Wow. Why did that happen? Because he exalted himself to be equal to God. He didn't refuse the people's praises. He didn't refuse the people's accolades. He didn't say, no, wait a minute. He accepted that and says, you're right, I pretty much am a God. Can I tell you this morning, God has no place for your pride. Pride comes before a fall. And God accepts a broken and contrite spirit will God never despise. <coughs> Humility is huge in the eyes of the Lord. God doesn't raise up men because they're capable. He, he makes them capable as he raises them up. Amen? Got very quiet in here. I love how Luke ends this. He says this in, in verse 24. Meanwhile, <laughs> all of this happens. And Luke brings us back to you. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread. And there were many new believers. You can't close a chapter better. So check out this observation. The chapter opens with James dead, Peter in prison, and Herod triumphant. It closes with Herod dead, Peter free, and the word of God triumphant. That's amazing. And then, how do you know? You know why? Because not the history truth as this pendulum swings. Here's what I know. No matter where the pendulum is, growth or shrinkage, uh, persecution and opposition, or the spread of the gospel, no matter where that is, Jesus had promised us this, that no matter what happens, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Give the Lord some praise. All right, so let me give you some, let me give you some applications to take home. You ready? Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. First application, pay, pay for your pastors and your leaders. We are, there's a military term for us, we are high value targets. Yes. Pray for us. Yeah. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Next. I love what Luke shows us about the destructive power of the enemy and the saving power of God. Remember that picture we saw at the beginning? We need to know that God empowers the powerless. And while the, destructive, while the power of the enemy may seem to be destructive, tearing things up all around us, remember that we have the saving power of God in our lives. And we need to pull on that power and utilize that power. Next up. When things look bleak and hopeless, remember that God, remember what God has done for you in the past. Sometimes you got to look backwards to look forward. I'll bet you if you looked at your life and really analyzed it in the, for the time you've been a Christian, you won't see times where God lets you down. You'll have this stepping stone pattern of what God has done every time as he moved in faithfulness in your life. Prayer is really the only power that the powerless possess. When we can do nothing about a situation, God can do everything. My favorite verse in this whole thing is while it looked really bleak, it goes on to say, but... The church prayed fervently for Peter. And I love when God steps in with that conjunction of but. When things in your life look hopeless and bleak and like you can't see what God is doing, just remember, but God can step in and absolutely change any situation. Next up. And let's pray expecting God to answer. Not just hoping. 
I can, if you can take home anything today, I hope you take home this. Prayer is not a wish. It's a powerful spiritual force that unleashes heavenly hosts on your behalf. That's right. And if we truly understood the effectiveness of prayer, we would pray much more frequently. Can you say amen? I think there's one more. God has the power, I love this, to overthrow hostile human plans and establish his plan in their place. Amen. So when you're looking around and the world is kind of collapsing on you or your family, remember, I love what we sang this morning. You took what the enemy meant for evil and you did what? Good. And you turned it for good. That's what we need to remember today. Give the Lord some praise. All right, we're going to close with this. I have just, I have, <coughs> pardon me, one really important announcement and then we're going to... Uh, take up our offering as we get ready to leave this morning and dismiss the church into the fellowship hall. So, I have a slide that I want to show. We don't do a lot of fundraising in this church. My wife and I have been here five years. We have not done a whole lot of money asking. We don't do that. Our church is just amazingly faithful. Uh, you saw in the membership, in the membership uh, meeting we had that God has been tremendously faithful to this church. Yes. And I believe it's because we support many ministries and we know where God's <coughs> priorities are and we follow those priorities. However, I do want to set a goal for this year. We're going to do a building improvement project. Now, someone said to me, well, Pastor, I don't see that this building needs much. I don't notice those things. See, when you've been here a while, you learn to live in what you live in. Mm -hmm. Right? It's right. like so when you start to accumulate too much junk, you don't really realize you have too much junk. junk. And if you don't think you have too much junk, why are they still building storage units on every corner in the country? Because people have too much junk. So you get blind to that. Now, we've had some great things happen in the last couple of years. Those of you who are new don't know this, but about two years ago, had you pulled up over here in that parking lot, you'd have been met with sand, sand spurs, and very large puddles. Because we just paved that parking lot a little over two years ago. So we got here, that was dirt. Um, the inside of the facilities look beautiful, thanks to Set Apart Remodeling. We've painted, we've made some changes, bathrooms, foyer, everything looks great. Fellowship Hall is in pretty good shape. The outside of the building, seriously, church, I'm just going to say this, it needs a facelift. Yeah. It's tired and saggy. Oh. The fascia is coming off the uh, roof line. The color is old and worn out. It's mostly coming off of the Fellowship Hall in large pieces, look like it's sunburned and peeling. <laughs> Yellow windows are absolutely hideous. Uh, these are yellow plastic shower doors. Seriously, if you don't believe me, go knock on them. You could be like Peter. <laughs> so what do we need to do? Well, we need to do some building improvement. I believe it's our responsibility to take care of God's house. That's right, amen. And I want to say this as your pastor. I think first impressions are critically important. And if I drove up to this church with a family of four, I'm not sure what my first impression would be. Just going to put that out there. So I'm asking us as a group to raise $20,000. We will paint the outside of the sanctuary, the fellowship hall, and the office suites behind us. All will be painted on the outside. We are replacing these windows with nice... Uh, low E. Low E and... Oblique. Oblique. Opaque. They're not see-through. You probably know the word better than I do. Anyway, it's a cloudy white. So it lets light in, but no one can see all our great equipment and steal it. Um, and they'll be insulated, so our power bill, I guarantee you, will drop by 30%. Because these have no insulation. We need windows, we need paint, we need new blinds. We have other things to go even beyond that that we want to do. So I'm asking you to uh, consider giving to our building improvement fund. That money will be used just for building improvements. So you can do that in a couple of ways. You can do that on a regular basis. I'm not going to take pledges. You can do that on a regular basis. You can mark your envelope, building fund, and we'll move that there. You can do it on tithing, mark building fund, and that portion will go to building. I am going to ask you to do this. Some of you work for people who are very generous and could use some tax deductions for their businesses. I would ask you to talk to your employers. Because helping a church is a nice tax break and a tax deduction. So we're looking to raise $20,000 to paint, to do windows. There was something else we were going to do. I don't recall. But anyway, that's um, blinds. That's where we're starting. So pray about that. If you're going to pray about that, I can tell you that the Lord is saying, please go ahead and give. There, you have answered prayer. Stand with me this morning if you would. If you're here this morning, we're here to pray with you.
I don't want you to feel like, hey, we're just going to rush you out the door. We are here to pray. If you have a need, come on forward. We've got elders that will pray with you. We've got pastors that will pray with you. We've got congregate members that will pray with you. So come forward this morning and spend some hour. Maybe you just want to come forward and spend some quiet time. You know, we need to utilize these altars more than we do. Amen? The other thing we're buying, I'm sorry, I'm like a, I'm bouncing back. We need a baptistry. We need a way to baptize people. So I'm looking at a couple of methods to baptize people that are portable. We can collapse them and put them away. So uh, on the high end, that's $3,000. On the affordable end, we can do it for about $800. So we're looking at getting a portable baptism in here because we need to start baptizing people on a regular basis. Yeah. So that's going to be very exciting. So part of our building improvement is to have access to a baptism. I would love to see baptisms every month. That would be my goal. That's crazy. Amen. So if you're uh, watching online, uh, please go to our website and hit the giving tab uh, at the storehouse.church. You can give electronically using our Tithely app. Uh, if you're here at, live in person, our offering basket is in the back. You can use Tithely as well. In about two weeks, we're going to introduce you to our new phone app. It's not quite ready yet, but it's really, really close. And you guys are going to think this is super, super cool because it is. And I'm excited about it. Father, we love you this morning. I thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the presence of God in our facilities and our building and in your people today. Lord, dismiss us, Father, so that we can see the opportunities before us. We can earnestly pray and we can expect and watch God's hand move in every situation. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hey, join us in the fellowship hall. Uh, don't run away. Go hang out with us for a little while.